Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Kelly Wallace, the California History Librarian at the Los Angeles Public Library. Before I introduce today's guests, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go over with you. First, if you'd like to know about more great programs like today's and when they're going to happen, send me an email at kwallace at lapl.org. You can see my email there on the screen. And I will add you to our notifications list. Uh, this will just be for programs, uh, history department programs, and I promise I will not bombard you with tons of emails. Second, this program is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later date on the library's YouTube channel. Now, once you go to the library's YouTube channel and you want to find this program, uh, just type in keywords writing themselves into history and it should bring the program right up. Lastly, uh, please type in any questions you have in the comments box and I will ask the presenters your questions at the conclusion of the program. And the side note, you must be logged in to a YouTube account to type into the comments section. All right, on to today's program. Kim Bancroft is a longtime teacher turned editor and writer. She earned a BA in English from Stanford, a teaching credential from San Francisco State, and a doctorate in education from UC Berkeley. She has taught at high schools and community colleges in the Bay Area, at the Universidad de Guanajuato in Mexico, and at Sacramento State. In her new book, she delves into the lives of her ancestors, Hubert Howe Bancroft, the renowned historian of the American West, and his wives, Emily and Matilda. Providing a vivid portrait of life in post-Gold Rush, California while detailing the largely unacknowledged contributions of the two women to their husband's groundbreaking work. She'll be in conversation today with fellow author and good friend, Frances Deaconsfield. Frances is an award-winning journalist and co-founder of the new site, Berkeley Side. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Daily Beast, People Magazine, and elsewhere. Her first book, I'm going to look at the notes so I get right, Towers of Gold, How One Jewish Immigrant Named Isaiah Hellman Created California, about her great-great-grandfather, was a San Francisco Chronicle bestseller and chosen as Best Book of the Year, as a Best Book of the Year by the Chronicle and the Northern California Independent Booksellers Association. Her second book, Tangled Vines, Greed, Murder, Obsession, and an Arsonist in the Vineyards of California, was a New York Times and San Francisco Chronicle bestseller and was named a best wine book of the year by the Wall Street Journal and Food and Wine Magazine. How incredible is it that both these authors had relatives in 1850s California who played outsized roles in the history of our state. Excited for our program, please welcome Kim and Francis and I'm gonna turn it over to you two. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. And before we uh, go on, um, I'd like to ask Kim, what's in the background of your screen? That is actually a copy of one of the letters that Emily Bancroft, H.H. Bancroft's first wife, wrote to her family back in, in uh, Buffalo, New York. Very cool. I have in, on my screen uh, a lithograph of Los Angeles in 1853. So I just uh, uh, wanted to show that. Um, and both, I think, our screens reflect how deeply rooted in history our families are and our interests are. Um, and before we sort of go uh, into writing themselves into history, I thought, Kim, it would be great to explain to the audience who Herbert Hugh Bancroft was and sort of you know, what he did and why he, he was important in preserving California's history. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting that we're here to talk about the women, but the women we need to present in the context of the, in this case, this one important man. So Hubert Howe Bancroft was uh, from a poor farming family in Ohio, and he ended up having to go to Buffalo at age 16 to work in his brother-in-law's book bookshop. He was not even able to go to high school or college. But he fell in love with books, and from there, in 1852, his uh, brother-in-law 
decided that the way to capitalize on the gold rush was to send books to California, to San Francisco. And much like your family's story, your great, great uh, grandfather's story, there was more to be found in selling to the miners than in actually trying to get the gold out themselves. So he came to California in 1852 and then started his bookshop in San Francisco, had another one in Sacramento later, Eventually, his enterprise grew into a huge publishing and printing business in San Francisco. And eventually, in the late 1850s, he became fascinated by the amount of change that was going on in San Francisco and the whole West and the enormous amount of new commerce, government, other developments. And he started collecting items, uh, government documents, pamphlets, books, oral histories, all kinds of things. And that collection then became what turned into his library. And from that library, he wrote his history of the Pacific West with a lot of help from researchers and other writers. And eventually in 1905, that collection uh, was bought by the University of California at Berkeley and transferred there in 1906. So that's a little thumbnail of who H.H. H. Bancroft was. We called him H.H. H. in our family. H.H. H. So certainly you grew up knowing you were a descendant of H.H. H. Bancroft, but you knew uh, much less about his wives, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, you know, found out about them and, and how and, and what led you to this project of of delving into their lives and letters. Yes. And I will say that one thing that was uh, really great to be able to have Francis do this talk with me is that we have had some similarities. When I read the introduction to your book, Towers of Gold, you talked about not really knowing that very much about your great, great grandfather's history and his contributions, his enormous contributions to California. And I would say the same was true even for, for my great, great grandfather. I did know that he had started the Bancroft Library, it was in Berkeley, and I ended up going to visit there with my father and my older brother Bradford and mother when I was a child. But it wasn't until 2008 when they had a renovation of the library that I went there and as part of the, a tour of the, of the new digs they had. And Teresa Salazar, the wonderful curator of Western Americana was standing by a 19, 1876 diary that Matilda Bancroft had written. And she chastised me. She said, Kim, you should come in here and read the diaries of your great, great grandmother. She was a writer in her own right. And frankly, I did not know of Matilda. If you had asked me my great, great grandmother's name, I, I wouldn't have known it, much less that she had done all of this writing. So that brought me into her writing. And as I was reading her diaries, she mentioned Sister Kate. And I I knew that my great great grandfather had three sons. We had heard all about them when I was growing up. I knew there was a, a daughter. I kind of remembered her name, but I'd never heard of Kate. And so I decided I had to go back to read H.H. H. Bancroft's autobiography, his 1890 autobiography, Literary Industries. And that's where I discovered that he'd had a first wife, Emily, who I'd never heard about and their daughter, Kate, and not to mention more stories about Matilda and, and his da their daughter, Lucy. That's it's, how am started. it's amazing how family history doesn't get passed down through the generations. I had a similar experience. I knew Isaiah Hellman had come to California. I was a fifth generation Californian. He had something to do with Wells Fargo Bank. That was about the only thing I knew about him. I went to the California Historical Society to look at some of his papers. I found out he had a brother named Herman. I never realized he had any siblings or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then I started to dig through the archives and little by little, like this portrait emerged of a man who'd come from Germany. Um, he was Jewish. He was coming to California because of the economic opportunity uh, and social opportunity afforded him. And he did very, very well. But like no details were passed down uh, through my family. And, and I think that's probably common for all of us, you know, yeah. that we forget. So 
tell me what you found. Like, like uh, this is a book that's a, a, a rich portrait of two women. What kind of primary source material did you find to bring these people to life? Before I say that, I also want to refer back to you for a moment, because when I started doing this research in 2008 is when your book had just come out. And I remember saying to you, this is phenomenal, Francis. I can't believe all of the research you put into this. How many years did you put in? And you said over 10. And that was a little daunting to me at the time because I was just starting out. I just found this and I thought, oh, I'm going to do this for 10 more years. And I did. It was about 12, 12 years. Wow. So I, when I began, I, I said, well, I need to find out who Emily is. I have no idea. And there are these letters that were at UC San Diego in their special collections. So at the time I was, I was teaching at Sac State and I would go down on summers for a week or spring break and go sit in the library there and start reading these. And immediately I just wanted to copy out what she was writing. And so I started typing and typing and copying. And, and eventually I thought, wow, there's some really interesting stories here from what life was like in the 1860s in San Francisco and what how she was trying to communicate with her family back in Buffalo. She, she loved her sister. She had a brother and her parents in Buffalo and felt so far away, 3000 miles away. And then they have one child, Kate in 1860. And as I was continuing to read her story that these, these sub stories developed, like for example, the illness that she kept speaking of. She had terrible migraine headaches. And then in 1864, she was writing about the death of their little baby girl who had been born fine and died two hours later. There were periods where her letters kind of disappeared and I presume she had gone back home. And, and one of the ways they talked about um, being pregnant at the time was being sick. So she talked about going home to be sick and um, but apparently another baby died during one of her visits home. So these stories were fascinating. And in the meantime, because I lived in Northern California, I could go to the Bancroft Library more often. And I was reading the diaries that Matilda had written. She had written one that was an 1876 diary that lasted to 1878 that included a two month journey that she took with her husband, whom she called Mr. Bancroft in her in that diary to the northwest and then when her babies were born she decided to write a diary for each of them for 10 years and these are hundreds of pages long describing their early lives their childhood where they were traveling to where they lived and of course by that time hh H. bancroft in 1876 had begun writing and collecting and was a, a public person. So she was trying to report on what their father had accomplished during those years of the 1880s and 90s. So it's very fortunate that Emily wrote so many letters home to her family and that Matilda kept these, these diaries or these journals, because um, I know like while trying to trace the life of Isaiah's Hellman, I was aided by looking at newspapers that would account things that he did, or, you know, even some sort of bank records um, or other sort of, you know, publicly noted uh, actions. And same with Hubert Howe Bancroft. I mean, he was a public man out there and there are probably newspaper articles mentioning him. But, you know, in our archive, in, in the public sphere, there is very little mention of women. And so I think, uh, you know, this is what's so special about your book is it really brings to life the experiences of women, you know, post gold rush and, and sort of the, you know, the difficulties they had. Um, I'd like to start with like how Hubert, how Bancroft met his wives, because like Isaiah Hellman, he didn't meet them in California. He had to go to the East Coast to, to meet these women. And mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that? And I guess there just were not that many women in California. To meet no, they, in, 18, in the 1850s, there weren't. And one of the things you said in your book about your great, great grandmother, Esther, was she was 19 when they met and married and that it was she had to be adventurous. These women had to be adventurous to travel 3000 miles 
across the country. And so I don't know specifically how H.H. Bancroft met Emily, but it's clear that he was in Buffalo because that's where his brother-in-law had his bookstore. And H.H. went back to restock his supply and somehow met Emily. Her father was actually um, an important personage in Buffalo at the time and also be, became a historian of Buffalo. So clearly in the world of commerce and history and people who um, enjoyed intellectual adventures in Buffalo, they met and he met Emily. And he writes in his autobiography about how he was able to convince Emily to uh, marry him. She was Presbyterian and much more religious than he was. And so that was a little bit of a risk for him, but he found her, he's, as he said, having a cultivated mind and above average intelligence for a woman. And he really wanted a companion who was going to be his intellectual equal, though he had never gone to college. He obviously loved reading and was an autodidact. And many of Emily's letters show how interested she was in society around her and the books that she was able to read. So that was Emily. And then uh, she died in 1869, I believe of kidney disease. That was what it was reported. And then seven years later, H.H. found Matilda in New Haven. By then, he had started writing the first volumes, again, with help, of his Bancroft's works, his History of the Pacific West. And he was trying to find academic folks who would support his work and uh, use it in their own studies. So he was in New Haven speaking with professors from Yale there and presumably met Matilda there as well. Also from a merchant family and somebody who was very intellectual in her own way. So let's just you know, talk about each woman, uh, you know, separately. So H, uh, H met Emily uh, before there was a transcontinental railroad, yes. went back to Buffalo, they decided to get married. Can you tell us about how they got to California and a little bit about what it was like when they arrived? Yes, and this is something that you know of too from your own family getting across the country. So either it was by stagecoach or by wagon, which would take months and months, or only a six week trip to go down the East Coast by steamer across the Isthmus of Panama by in, in uh, 1859, they could use the railroad. Before then, it was by canoe and mule and uh, almost deadly with so many diseases and chances of people stealing your things, which is what happened to H.H. on one of his trips across um, prior to 1859. But then once you got across the Isthmus of uh, Panama, you went back up the other coast on a different steamer. So that took six weeks. And it was a, an arduous journey. There was one letter from Emily where she talks about her daughter falling over the ship, pitching over, but she was attached by a chain. This is a two-year-old at the time. And Emily reeled her back in and said, I managed to save her. So it was a perilous journey just, just to get there. And as I remind people now when they get concerned if they haven't sent back a letter to me the same day, that it, if you sent a letter, as Emily would, back to Buffalo, it would take six weeks to get there along that same route. And then another six weeks before you'd even hear a reply, 12 weeks before you got a reply back. So we should, we should ease up on each other and ourselves. Wow. So H. Eight and Emily marry. They come to um, San Francisco, and so what is Emily's role then? What is a woman expected to do when she's a new wife and she's coming to a rough and tumble town? Well, I, I think that's a really great question, Francis, and it gets at a little bit why women have tended to be somewhat invisible and silenced throughout our history, because the men had these public roles, as H.H. did, or as Isaiah Hellman did, where they're contributing in very public and important ways to the society, and the women are expected to support the man and to raise the children, to provide food, to make a comfortable, warm, secure, homey, loving environment, which is what Emily did and wrote about in her letters. That was important to her. 
And uh, eventually, as you say of your great great grandmother, to contribute to society in other ways through clubs and activities to arrange parties and gatherings and luncheons. Um, for Emily, that that she was attached to a man who continued to move back and forth and back and forth. I mean, they had something like 13 times they were moving within a year and a half that I could count. And he, they started in San Francisco, it was cold. He had a poor respiratory uh, system himself. She ended up having her own ailments. So they'd moved to Oakland and then back to San Francisco to Alameda. And so, um, I get a sense that she didn't really attach herself to any particular organizations and that that was true for Matilda as well. But but having a creating a wonderful home and entertaining as much as that was possible for a, a shy man like H.H. H. Bancroft was part of what their their roles were. So I do like in how in some of Emily's letters, when she's writing back to her family on the East Coast, she's describing California almost like it's a foreign country. She yes. tells them what kind of food they're, want, they're eating, you know, what the houses look like, they're wooden because they're afraid of earthquakes, sort of some of the people that she was meeting. Um, you know, they stayed at the Palace Hotel, which was, of course, the big hotel in San or one of the big hotels in San Francisco. And, um, you know, she, she sort of describes it as, you know, as she, not like she's an alien, but it's something that's new and different to her. Right. And, um, you know, I, I think California was that to the United States. It was right. you know, maybe it's still that way today. Like we're different here. We, we try things differently. So, yeah. um, so Emily, one of the things that she had to do was to uh, make homes for, for Bancroft and, um, I also love how they bought a house. Where was it? And it was, you know, written in the boondocks. Uh, and uh, the homeowner's dream fulfilled in the boondocks. And uh, they bought a ha they bought a lot to build on it. And where is this located? It's like now in central San Francisco. Well, that was actually Matilda. Oh. So in in eighteen. 80 and it was still oh no actually you're right there was Emily and they were they bought a place that was a, a lot that was now at, in the center of San Francisco at Geary and California Street and there was way up in the dunes because everything was the dunes at that time and they had wanted to buy and to buy and to buy and finally did and she wrote about how far away it was that if some another woman came to visit, they would actually have to spend the night because it was too far away to get back by the evening and especially trudging through so much of the sand up there. So yeah, we see how much life really changed in San Francisco. And that was just from 1865, when 1868, when they were living there. Right, just the physical uh, demands on your body to be living in this sort of you know, area. The idea, you're, you, you draw this image of, you know, how exhausted the women could be by traipsing up the sand dune. It's like everything was an excursion. It wasn't, yes. it was an effort. Right. Emily said, by the time somebody has returned from downtown, they're dragged and tired out half to death. And so it, she, she was a little concerned that women in San Francisco were, were too genteel for this kind of life. So can we talk a little bit about the, the daughter that Emily had and sort of her medical uh, situation? Well, so Emily had her, her first and only daughter in 1860, and it turned out that she was not able to have any more children. And in fact, after this, this baby died in 1864, the doctor told her and HH that they should not have any more children. And what I ended up trying to discover was what was the source of her medical problem. And I, I went from one doctor to another and finally discovered this wonderful doctor at, and at Stanford, Dr. Ryan Lal, an endocrinologist. And I had written up all of the notes that I had from the book, from her letters about the different symptoms she had. She had these terrible headaches. She called them sick headaches, as people did in that day that we call migraines that she seemed to get every time she ate anything that was from a cooked or natural sugar. And then she started having these problems with having babies that were born 
fat and healthy, but would die soon afterwards. And Dr. Lal suggested that she probably had developed diabetes. There wasn't a term for that at that time. And also looking at her photograph saw that she had a, a kind of growth on her neck and, and which was a goiter, he assumed. And so she had thyroid problems. And there was one letter that was interesting that I found on the, uh, apparently HH must have asked the family to send back all of her letters after she passed away. And he collected them into these wonderful um, binders, leather covered binders. As he was an archivist, he was wont to do that. And on the back of one of these letters that was sent from an aunt, Aunt Marion, and said, I'm sorry that I kept this letter for so long. I didn't realize that she had lost three children. Mm -hmm. So they, there were several of these deaths that they had to, to tolerate. And she was pregnant again in um, 1869. And one of the last letters to her sister was saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't written a while. I didn't want to worry you. I'm, I'm going to be sick again, as she called it, in February. Don't worry about me. And in fact, that, that pregnancy contributed to surely to what was also her ongoing, what she called wasting and fatigue. And, and by then retinopathy, she couldn't see very well. And so she died in December, 1869. Wow. And, uh, she, you know, they did seek lots of medical treatment for her, but yes. nobody <laughs> knew what diabetes really was or how to. Yeah. No. I mean, one of the interesting treatments was at, uh, back in Granville, Ohio, where HH, his family came from. And for some reason, everybody in their family, the men were, called by their initials. So he had an uncle named W.W. Bancroft who had a, um, a kind of sanitarium there in Granville and offered the water cure. So she wrote about these uh, from there, how he was trying to get her to cleanse her body of every kind of other food that might be bad for her and, and then use this water cure, submerge in water to extricate the toxins. And of course, that did not work either. But she she was had some humor in her letters and said, "Well, when you see me, you'll need to bring a wheelbarrow to collect my my sticks and bones when when I'm next visiting." So she was uh, open about being treated this way, but she referred to her pregnancies as sickness and wasn't particularly. Uh, she didn't go into depth about about those things in her letters. Well, at that last one, I mean, all women talked about pregnancy is being sick. I'm going to be sick. That's, that's how it was referred to. And I think the, that last one, she was a little nervous about telling the family because HH had already informed them back in 1864 that the doctor had said she should not be pregnant again. So this was kind of a warning that this was going to be dangerous for her. And it was, she was in, in no shape by then to be pregnant. And childbirth was very deadly then, as it turns out, it still is today, according to recent uh, studies yes. about maternal mortality. Yes. So she died, and what was the impact on H. H. Bancroft? Well, yeah. He he was he was devastated. He loved her very much, and in his autobiography, Literary Industries, he wrote about how how depressed he was. He just kind of, but at that time, it was by 1869, he had already got very involved in collecting and was trying to write an almanac and start his, um, his do, doing something with his collection. By then he had 16,000 items in his collection. And this woman friend very famously said to him, the next 10 years of your life will be your best. What will you do with them? And he it kind of kicked him into motion to say, yeah, I, I don't want to just be depressed for the rest of my life here. I, and I have all of these items. And he was a very ambitious person. So he had started by 1876 to, to work on collecting these items into usable form. He started out with an encyclopedia, the idea of an encyclopedia of the West, and then he decided it should be a, a narrative. And so his work kept him going during those years. And until he found Matilda in 1876. And he had his daughter, Kate, 
um, who he wrote about in his autobiography, who was very attached to him and very much a part of his life and his travels, and in some cases, even some of his work going to missions and collecting information, the California missions. But she ended up also going to the same boarding school that Emily had gone to, Miss Porter's in, in uh, Farmington, Connecticut, which still exists, actually. So his marriage uh, to Matilda uh, seemed to me to be sort of different than his marriage to Emily in the sense that she was more modern. Uh, it, it, you know, I might be projecting this, but she played more of a role in his work and she was more involved in sort of the business aspects of things. And I'm hoping you can talk about that and also tell me, do you think that that was because of Matilda's personality or had mm -hmm. times changed or had HH evolved in terms of like his, his regard for women? I'm not sure that H.H. evolved entirely because he was sort of famously chauvinistic, though he did have one woman who ended up working in his workshop, his literary workshop that was turning all of this mass of material into books. But times were different. Um, and by 1876, he was now a public person. He was writing this, this history. He was shopping it around. He had gotten to know a lot of people who he had been interviewing in order to collect oral histories, but also documents. And so he was much more of a public person. And I think that when he married Matilda, I, I don't know what happened when they, they met and discussed, but she was also very familiar, having come from New Haven, Connecticut, with a public life and public scholarship and, and intellectual material. She was clearly attracted to the possibilities of getting to be with a husband who was doing all of this work, traveling and talking to people. And so it must have been a, an attraction for her to marry him and, again, go 3,000 miles away, but be part of his, his adventures and scholarship. And he did very much want her to be part of that. And he talked about in his book, um, for example, in his autobiography, when they were married and had a, a kind of working, they had working honeymoons. Um, at first, he was traveling about the, the East again, they, the two of them were, and meeting some of the people who had been important to California history, like um, Sutter, who, on whose land the, the gold was found. And he was, H.H. was doing an oral history of him. And he said, my, my wife sat patiently by, attentive to my questions and offering her own questions. So I think he appreciated from the beginning that she could have a role in helping. And then later when they were back in California, he was editing and he taught her how to help edit his work and be a, a critic of what he was writing so that she would be useful. So he did give her that amount of credit um, and she continued to, when she started these diaries, which I think he also encouraged her to do, he would sometimes pick from some of her passages and use them in his writing as well. So he was very much attentive to having a wife who would be a helpmate in that classic sense. So that might have just been what Matilda was like. She was more eager to jump into that than Emily had been. Yes, and also it was it was a different time. I mean, I I like I suddenly realized they were married to different men. That that H. H. Bancroft during the 1860s was running a bookstore and was beginning to collect things. But he wasn't a, a public person, and he didn't have this grand project in mind that he was going to write a history of the West. By 1876, he was very dedicated to that. And he, I'm sure he felt he wanted a wife who would help him with that and be, um, be in, involved in it in as many ways as possible. So one area that she played a, a role that you discuss in the books is she interviewed uh, women in polygamous marriages for the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Jesus. Yes. I, yeah, I'm not saying that right. But anyway, can you, uh, you know, how did she get so lucky to actually be able to do that work? Well, she actually wanted to do more oral histories, I believe. And she began in 1878 when they went to the Great Northwest and they were in uh, on Vancouver Island in Victoria. And H.H. was doing some oral histories of some of the early settlers up there. 
and she had sat with Reverend John Good, who had been one of the early ministers and had done a lot of work with the native people out on what became Vancouver Island. And she said, I craved as a favor to take dictations. That's what they called the oral histories at that time. And sat with him for five days with great assiduity, writing down everything he said as fast as he could talk. And they are amazing stories. I read the whole dictation about what he had experienced and what the native people experienced that he was able to reveal the invasion and the, the poverty, the disease. And I, I also thought about how through these dictations, Matilda got an amazing education herself. So she wanted to continue and she said, but I was thrown out of employment because later they met um, Mr. Amos Bowman, who was a, a engineer and had a, a great scientific mind, as she said, and he took over doing the oral histories that she had hoped she would be able to do. But later, and uh, when they were traveling in Utah and then um, in San Francisco, H.H. Bancroft wanted to get some of the oral histories of the Latter-day Saints folks, and it would have probably not been very proper for a man to interview the women. So Matilda did, and I'm sure that she was able to ask questions about what it was like to be in a polygamous marriage and what, what these women felt like when their husband wanted to take another, another wife. And they revealed quite a bit speaking to her, perhaps in private, but it was all written down that Matilda got this information that was very unusual to be able to share those stories, I believe. So I love the detail where she interviewed one woman whose, whose husband had many wives. And she said that the wives trained the husband not to give them all identical presents, but to give them individualized presents. <laughs> That's right. She yeah. said she said they, he was a bit of a dunderhead in his own way, and he, and that it was important to show that each wife, if there was ten of them, even they each had their own individual personality, and he should note that through his gifts. I'm uh, I'm not sure that how many people remember that um, Mormons were very important to the settlement of of California. Sam Brannan was the person who ran through the streets uh, holding his newspaper saying, you know, gold has been discovered up at Sutter's Fort. And uh, members of the church uh, had a huge settlement in San Bernardino, and they were really critical in the development of California, certainly during the 1850s and early 1860s. They later mostly went to Utah because they were being persecuted, but, um, uh, you know, definitely critical for California's development. Um, so she came to California, she um, helped HH in some of his uh, some of his projects, but clearly her main role was to be mother of four children. Can you tell us about the family um, and where you you fall in this line of uh, Bancrofts? Yes, well, so they had, Matilda and HH had four children, three boys and a girl. And uh, the oldest son was Paul, who turned out to be Paul Sr. And I and my three brothers are the children of Paul III. So those, uh, she, as I said, wrote a diary about each of those three, uh, four children. And she did become primarily the mother and caregiver. And she even said it, it was her delegation when the, the four children would travel together with her and they would often have a nanny or two or a governess uh, to help. These children were born within two years of each other. So they were all very close in age, um, some within a year and a half of each other. So it was important for her to be able to be not only available for taking care of them, but because they traveled so much. And I'm not sure what other reasons, but she also became their primary educator. They had a lot of homeschooling. From time to time, they would be put in a school where they were traveling to. For example, they were in Denver for a couple of months while HH was getting information from local organizations there, the history, oral histories. And so the children were sent off to a kindergarten and they walked to that school. Apparently it was a quarter of a mile away or more. Um, but mostly she was trying to oversee not only their education, but uh, some of the properties they had. So they ended up leaving San Francisco and moving to buying a farm in Walnut Creek 
in part because they kept trying to get away from the cold and the fog, which was not good either for HH or their youngest son, Philip, who had some severe respiratory problems as well. And so Matilda was a wonderful manager of the properties that they had and trying to keep track of when they were building farms and who was living there and uh, then renting out businesses like when they're at their home in San Francisco, when they left for seven years, they ended up renting that out. Eventually, they also had a property in San Diego in Spring Valley that became a farm as well as a downtown home. So she was on the move and she was quite a manager for all of those, those properties as well. Yeah, so she played a significant role in keeping the finances of the family, you know, afloat, enlarging and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So even though HH was very chauvinistic, as you put it, and didn't particularly support you know, sort of the public life of Matilda or Emily, uh, she was really instrumental in, in, in making the family function so he could go off and do his thing. Exactly. And I, and I think that's one, one reason why it's wonderful for me and for all of us to have these letters and journals is because you get to see the kind of interstices of what women's lives were like, the community, the family, what, how they were contributing to supporting the public man and making it possible for the man to go off and do whatever he was doing. You know, I, I know that uh, for you, you've mentioned your great great grandmother Esther had um, her opportunities to join clubs and and com and contribute to this the local community through some of those methods that I, I wish you would share a little bit of um, from from your perspective. So, I mean, it's, it was really notable the different way men and women, you know, were, were talking through letters during that time. And um, I.W. Hellman, who started the Farmers and Merchants Banks in Los Angeles, the first successful bank, who went on to own the Nevada National Bank and then Wells Fargo Bank and was considered the premier financier in California, uh, you know, up until 1920 when he died. Um, you know, there was plenty of information, as I mentioned, in, 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 in his personal letters, his business letters and in the newspapers. But I found it kind of hard to write about the women in his life. And um, I had seen that his wife, Esther, had you know, been mentioned in newspapers about joining, you know, the Kindergarten Society in L.A. And then she, up in San Francisco, she was part of uh, her temple's sisterhood and they started the Kindergarten Society. But like all that kind of information was almost... Um, you know, kind of just bare. There, there was, there were no rich details. But I was very fortunate that um, uh, there had been this young girl named Rosalie Meyer, whose father was Eugene Meyer, whose uh, uh, Rosalie Meyer ended up marrying Sigmund Stern, who was a descendant of Levi Haas, um, and 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 Sigmund Stern Grove in San Francisco is named after him. Rosemary moved up to San Francisco when her father decided to take a job with the uh, Lazard Frere Banking Company. And she wrote a lot of letters back to her friends in L.A. and they wrote to her. And I found these letters uh, in the Magnus Museum collection, now part of the Bancroft Library, where the young women would write to each other. And what they wrote about had nothing to do with, you know, bond percentages or funding a railroad. It had to do with the Flower Society in San Francisco. And um, I found a letter. Uh, someone went to the bar mitzvah of Isaiah's Helmand's son, Marco, and she detailed the presence he got. And then I also found out that Isaiah's Helmand's brother, Herman, had a daughter who died. I saw nothing of that in Helmand's letters, but one young woman in L.A. had written to Rosalie Meyer about that. And like that is a very critical piece of information that, you know, the men didn't think to write down, but the women thought to write down. So I think it's really important to try to uncover as much of women's stories and observations as possible as you've done in writing themselves into history, because it really enriches our understanding of the past. And, and also what you talk about is that your great great grandmother was involved in the benevolent society the trying to help other Jewish immigrants as they were coming in and the flower um, society was also trying to help poor people and get settled those who who didn't have homes i mean it, i if you could say some more about that i think that it's wonderful how women were doing that and weren't necessarily recognized for their contributions 
Well, so there was a time when, you know, socially the focus for women expanded beyond the home. And in the 1880s, um, among, you know, Jewish society, there was a huge influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, pr prior to that, most of the Jews in, in California and the United States had come from Central Europe. And um, there were differences between the two groups. And uh, so the Jews who were already settled here, uh, you know, wanted to help the Jews that were coming in. There was a little bit of a patronizing attitude because the Central European Jews were pretty assimilated and the Euro Eastern European Jews were more devout, they dressed differently. And so um, people like Esther Hellman and others wanted to sort of like civilize these Eastern European refugees. And they set up, you know, settlement homes and they taught English and they taught, uh, you know, how to look for a job. And they tried to Americanize these people. And, you know, while there were sort of this aspect of maybe not really embrace them completely, but wanting to change them. It also really opened the way for women in, in California to become much more public. And that was really the beginning of, of, a, of a big shift in women's roles in the world. So um, I'm wondering if we have any um, comments from the audience. Yes. Uh... Let me show, I have a question here. Um, and this is a great question. Uh, given the huge mm -hmm. amount of research that you, I mean, collected, did, and the fact like 10 years, 12 years of work, how do you whittle it down and make a cohesive, you know, <laughs> manageable 300, 400 page book? Both of you can speak on this if you'd like. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, first, Francis, since you, you're the elder in writing a fantastic elder. manuscript. Right. Uh, that's a really good question. That's why it takes so long. Um, so, you know, the very first thing you do is you go and you read as many documents as you can and you try to absorb, sort of internalize the lives that these people have led because unless you know your material really, really well, you can't go out then and try to craft a story. Um, so for me, uh, I think my process was probably different than Kim's because I was writing a biography of Isaiah Hellman. So I filed, a, I, I followed a chronological uh, structure, you know, from you know who he was as a kid, why he came to California, what he did in California, et cetera. And um, I also was trying to create a narrative arc. I was trying to build characters. I was trying to build tension. I was trying to create a book that people would want to read, that there was some forward momentum. And sometimes as a writer, when you do that, you might emphasize certain periods in someone's life over other periods in their lives. Uh, for example, I opened my book with this very famous bank run in Los Angeles in 1890s, uh, went during a depression in the United States and Hellman came down from San Francisco with a train load of gold that he took from the vault in Wells Fargo Bank and he piled it up on his bank in LA and uh, he sort of, um, uh, he piled in towers of gold and all his, you know, depositors rushed into the bank. They wanted to withdraw their money, just like what happened last week with Silicon Valley Bank, yeah. but they were sort of reassured when they saw the towers of gold piled on the bank's uh, counters. So, you know, um, you know, that was a dramatic moment that I want to illustrate. So sometimes that helped me organize the book because I, I chose particular moments that I emphasize. Mm -hmm. And I, I am glad that you referred back to the recent bank run in Silicon Valley. That another fantastic part of your book is remembering how certain things, for example, the flu, we've just gone through the flu pandemic that was at the early 1918, we've just gone through it again and issues with bank runs and things like that. So um, it's always very relevant. I recommend everybody read Towers of Gold if you can. For me, the I guess there was a certain chronology as well because there was a first wife and the second wife but the letters, trying to follow the, the history of the letters and just have how present them in the way that, for example, Emily did. She would write on Monday and write two paragraphs and then she'd say, well, I've got to get the wash finished and then write another two paragraphs on Tuesday. And it would be a completely different topic. So it didn't seem really 
a good method to just have the letters as they were presented. I wanted to subdivide into different topics that were relevant to first her immediate family and then a second chapter that was more about other members of the family and people they knew and then kind of continue out as I was talking about their lives. And the last chapter about her is about her demise and taking the thread of her illness up through the end. Then with Matilda, it was very clear that she had so many different roles in her life as a, as a writer, as a mother, as an oral historian, as a businesswoman. I wanted to kind of focus on those different topics that I had found in her writing. And again, because there were these diaries were about each child and kind of following them through for 10 years of their lives. It didn't seem like a good method to just take one diary and, and, and follow through. There was another diary, for example, that was all about a trip they took to Mexico that was very interesting uh, in the late 1890s. But I, there was just so much material, I had to leave that whole chapter out. But it is, a, it is a good practice trying to figure out what's relevant. And for me, I also noticed that I was really trying to include as many words from these women as passages mm -hmm. from their, their writing. And Francis, uh, in your book, you did a phenomenal job of, of researching so much more of what was going on in the society around I.W. Hellman. And um, so, so they're, they're kind of different in that respect, too. So one of the hardest things is being able to read the handwriting of these people. I'm looking at this letter behind you. Like, yeah. could, how, how hard was it to interpret what they were oh, saying? Oh, it's very difficult. And I mean, there were times I would spend minutes looking at one, one word and say, is that room or is it soon? and trying to get how some of the, the letters were, were just kind of mashed together. And one of the thing, things that's very interesting and yet another project for somebody if they would like this, the, the letters from Emily's parents to her, they were so careful about saving paper that they would turn the paper to its side and write crosswise over the letter over the, the words and, and write them perpendicularly. And I, after a while, I just said, okay, I've got enough material from Emily herself to her sister and to her parents. I'm going to just have to leave this other volume aside. So um, that's how precious paper was back in the day. That's madness. Uh, anyway, can't imagine. Uh, I just want to reiterate what you talked a little bit about in the beginning about that family histories don't get passed down. And I know that is very true. And we experienced that here at the library because we have a lot of patrons come in and researching their family histories um, or their, you know, the misunderstandings or untruths are told or whatever. But it's fascinating to me that with such well-known ancestors, still the same thing happened. Um, so I wonder if you want to talk just briefly, either one of you on, I don't know, uh, the importance of, you know, telling the family stories or how people who, you know, they don't have to publish a history of their ancestor, but somehow collecting the family stories and histories in some way. Yes. At, and Francis and I talked a little bit about that. I, I think there's a kind of weight once you find this material. And I don't know about you, Francis, at what point you felt like, oh, my God, I need to write about all of this. I need to publicize. I need to publish this information. And in the case of these women, because it was so unusual, and I think that was true for your great great grandfather's story too, getting the uh, Jewish history of California out. But when these stories haven't been heard, and we are writers and we are book lovers, we want others to know that this these stories have have been written and they need to come out of the archives and into the public. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's nothing more fun than just going into the archives and seeing what's there, and you know. I, um, I, I spent a lot of time in the LA Public Library looking through the photographs, looking through the old history books, looking through the newspapers. Um, and so, uh, you know, thank you, LAPL, you know, and I encourage people to do that. It, it's, you know, I think one of the reasons in my family's case, 
Isaiah Hellman was very well known and very famous in his lifetime. And, you know, when he died, it was bannered in a lot of newspapers around the state. And I think for his children and then maybe even his grandchildren, they just took it for granted that he was somebody who was known and they didn't think it was important to, to completely to document anything, really. Um, though I will say his grandson did donate most of his papers to the California C Historical Society, except for a very slim volume of uh, all the dirt in the family. And um, some of that I found at a relative's house and some of that I found it had been segregated and sort of like put in a do not show anyone file in the California Historical Society. But a fantastic archivist pulled out this box and handed it to me. And it was like all the, the scuttlebutt. And I was so grateful. Um, but, you know, I do think that time passes and, and people assume that what you know in one generation will be passed down. But that really is not always the case. Yeah. Well, um uh, Kim, you mentioned that he started collecting, you know, right in the beginning when he was collecting, you know, pamphlets and government documents and stuff, because that's another thing, you know, so much of this ephemera, nobody saves it. They don't think of it. It's not made to be, you know, permanent. It's meant just to be, you know, something handed out on the street or whatever. And so it's only someone like your great, great grandfather or something that gets lost in somebody's attic or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's always mm -hmm. rich. But I wanted to ask you, Kim, I read somewhere that you live basically off the grid, correct? Yes, in the, that is true. Somewhere in the woods of Northern California. Yes, yes. And that you mentioned that there were times that you had to use oil lamps and candles to write. Yes. Like H.H. H. H. Bancroft. I yes. I mean, that was one of the, that was one of those aha wonderful moments when I read Emily's letter to her family back east saying, we have oil kerosene lamps. You don't know how wonderful this light is because before that it was oil or, or candles. And so now she, or whale oil, and this was a new um, technology that helped them be able to see and sew and write and read later at night. When I moved to my cabin in the woods in 2010, that was actually when I was just beginning to go through H.H. H. Bancroft's uh, 18, 1890. I'm, I'll show this to you. It's this thick. This is his original autobiography. And I would read it with kerosene lamps because my um, solar panels were not working as, as shoddy as they were at that time in February of 2011. So I uh, had much to enjoy. And still I'm off grid. I have solar panels that are better now and better ba batteries, but I, um, I relate very much to what it's like to try to live a simpler life as they did. It wasn't so simple actually back in those days if it, you had to take a stagecoach and a, a railroad to get across country. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, I just want to thank you both so much. It was fascinating. I encourage our audience to read all of your books. And um, that's it. Do we, I, either one of you have a closing remarks? Well, I will say you're showing our um, our websites there. And yes, I've got a blog that I'm doing on my website and there's several other events listed that are coming up both in person and remote. But I, I really want to thank you both for this opportunity. And, and Francis, we actually were at Stanford at the same time many, many years ago when there was a whole explosion of women's activities at that time, activism, women's studies, when the Women's Center, women's newspaper. And I'll be doing a talk with Estelle Friedman in May that's on my site that will both reflect uh, that activism at the time, as well as the fact that Estelle was one of the first women's histories, history class that I took that included doing an oral history at the time. And so I am, I am so thankful to her and to others who've gone before that have helped us bring these voices out of, out of the silence. Yeah, that'd be fascinating because we sort of just I don't know, take it for granted. But I mean, somebody had to say, oh, yeah, no, we need to study 
women's history and to yeah. bring that all about. So yeah, so that was that was just in the late 1970s. It wasn't exactly. that long ago. Mm -hmm. I also took exactly. a class with Michelle Friedman that, that changed my life. So um, you know, we, women's history has not been uh, you know looked at closely for that long a period of time. Fascinating. Thank you again. It was a wonderful presentation. Again, it will be available for viewing on the library's YouTube channel. And uh, hopefully we'll sometime in the future have another program. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.